I'll only believe it when I see it. Always a new battery. <laughs> something about Fuji having a new battery. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Fujifilm's X-T4. This is the fourth edition to Fujifilm's X-T range and it's a camera that is packed with new features. I'm going to be focusing on three aspects of the new X-T4. These are three things that I look at in a new camera that I find incredibly important. So let's see how the X-T4 holds up. The first one is form and function. Now when I talk about function I'm not talking about the menu system and the layout. I'm talking about the actual physical nature of this camera from buttons to build quality. It's form, how easy it is to use, it's durability. And I've been very fortunate to have owned the X-T1, the X-T2, the X-T3, and now I had a look at the X-T4. So I've seen the progression. I mean, those of you who've owned the X-T1, for example, know of its shortcomings. And um, we know, for example, that the leatherette grip on the camera would peel after a pretty short amount of time. It gets a bit sweaty or you know, a bit of pressure and a corner peels up and next thing you know, a lot of the grip is peeling. So a lot of cameras were going back to Fujifilm inside and outside of warranty to get those grips repaired. We know that these top dials, now obviously remember this is the first one of these cameras that they had made, um, after a certain amount of use would start getting grogged up and sort of um, jammed and you couldn't turn them. And if you could turn them, they would turn the bottom drive dial as well below it and things like that. So. Um, yeah, there was a lot to improve on. So the X-T1 had the portability, it had the image quality, it had a lot of things going for it, but it wasn't as reliable as people had hoped, especially from a professional perspective, even though I did use it professionally. So when the X-T2 came out, Fujifilm made the effort not only to improve on the sensor and the obvious things that people expect in an update, they improved on the important things. Grip wasn't peeling at the same time in its life cycle as the X-T1 top buttons on the top plate were way easier to use, you could lock them off. You weren't finding that the bottom one was spinning as well as the top. Uh, after a certain amount of use they might tighten up a little bit but would never get to the point of totally jamming like they did on the X-T1. And again on the X-T3, improved even further. I don't see that problem at all, I don't hear of anyone having a, the leather repeal, maybe there is people out there but it's a very very small number. And this brings me to the point uh, to something I was thinking about the other day because I had actually spoken to a camera repair guy in Cape Town, a very well respected guy. I'm not going to tell you it is because he has he deals with all different camera brands, and I don't want to give the impression he doesn't like any particular camera brand. But they are the best people to speak to because they see the cameras coming in for repair. They know which camera brand and which camera within that brand is the regular offender. They know what parts of the camera are weak and are going to go and they have a good insight into cameras. Uh, he himself also repairs Fujifilm along with all the other top brands that are in South Africa. So it was interesting to chat to him. And, and the conversation started when I looked over, his, I dropped off um, um, my sensor to be cleaned and I'd seen a, a camera lying there for repair and it was a camera that I'd used in the past and I'd said to him, that's a tough camera, you know, you've got to give it its respect, it's an incredibly tough camera and he said, you're absolutely right, that that particular camera um, that series of camera 
was one of the toughest shutter mechanisms that he had ever worked with. So he doesn't see it coming in for shutter issues. And if it does come in, like say for example, the camera's rated at 300 or 500,000 acquisitions, it's coming in at like a million or even more. And I know I'd put that camera through its paces, I'd hammered it and it, it lasted the time for me. So he agreed with me. But then we got into a conversation as in how this negatively impacted the next model coming in in that same camera brand. And what had happened was is that this camera brand um, realized that if a camera is going to last too long and go out of that two to three year cycle, then there's less chance of them, the, that same photographer buying the new one. Or even that they can make money through repairs because now after two to three years you're out of warranty, have to drop the camera off for repairs, they make money that way. And if it's an expensive repair, then you're forced to upgrade because you don't want to change your system because you've put all the money into the lenses. So what they did was, is in the next one that came out, they actually handicapped it and he showed me how the shutter is not lasting nearly as long. It's not the same mechanism as before. So they took out a tried and trusted and proved shutter mechanism and put in an inferior one by design. They deliberately un they, they um, under-designed the camera as opposed to sort of under-engineered as opposed to over-engineered the camera, deliberately handicapping it so that it would shorten its life increase sales and so on and so forth. And we see this in other products. I mean, any of you guys have a dishwasher or a washing machine and, and remember your parents' ones. I mean, my folks, washing machine and dishwasher, I mean, dishwashers came a bit later, but those lasted like 20, 25 years. Dishwasher and washing machine companies can't make money if their products last that long. They've got to shorten the life. So now if you buy something, if it gets five years, you've bought a good product. And that's by design. People think they don't know how to make things like they used to. No, no, they could make more superior things more than likely to what they used to. It's just that why design it to last when you can make more money by failing it. So I'm really impressed when a camera manufacturer in particular, um, I have been with Fujifilm, put the customers first. Like they'll go and they'll deliberately improve. They'll, they'll, they'll make sure to improve on things that they know were weak points and were costing not only them if falling under warranty, but outside of warranty, costing their, uh, costing their clients money for unnecessary things that could have even profited Fujifilm. So I've seen them improve on things exactly in those things. So they've improved shutter mechanisms, they've improved the durability of the shutter mechanisms, they've improved the camera's quality as in um, its physical durability, they've improved all these little things like the button dials because you remember the more buttons and the more areas that you have on the camera that you can be working on you have more failure points. And um, that's why I always believe that simple is always best because the more areas you, you put on a camera, the more problems you're going to have. But true to, you know, true to sort of what we've seen from Fujifilm so far on the X-T4, every one of these points has been improved. I can feel it even when you push the, 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 the D-pad at the back. You know, those buttons over time tend to get soft and even push in and you have to like hit them again to get them to come out. Those are weak points on previous models. I think there's going to be less chance of them happening. So they're making this camera more durable, longer lasting, which I think you've got to give a lot of credit to. So anyone who picks up this camera, first of all, you're going to know straight away that this is a, a premium product. If any of you got, had the opportunity of picking up those really premium products like your Leicas and so on, which cost an absolute fortune, you know part of the reason why they cost so much is the premium feel. You pick up a Leica M, it's that width on the body, that solid metal, uh, that they use on the actual body, it's the way it's been designed, you feel feeling like you're, you're holding a premium product. And what I find is that the beginning on the X-T1, you didn't have that, you always had that, it was premium but it didn't, you felt that somewhere something was going to go, it just, it didn't um, give me the, the highest level of confidence, even though it was relatively strong, you always felt that like if I drop this and knock this really hard, it's not going to turn out great for this camera. But what I find um, as the models have gone on, these have improved and now with the X-T4 it's felt more premium than ever before. So a simple thing like just holding the camera with its bigger grip design, um, with its more sort of chunkier body, obviously we'll get into the, the in-body image stabilizer soon, but and the materials used, it's a premium product and it feels great in hand. I actually prefer it to the slightly smaller body to be honest. And I'm just really impressed. Like things have changed. They've obviously improved, they increased the size of the EVF housing and the way that the buttons actually sort of cut into the housing now. You know, that things have changed on this body, but the overall size is pretty much the same, but they've given you a premium feel. Is it at the same level of the X, as the X-Pro3? No, that is the pinnacle. When it comes to durability, X-Pro3, from what I've seen and what I've held, is the strongest camera. That's a tank. This is not quite there yet. 
Um, I think by nature it will never really be because of the amount of dials and buttons on this compared to the X Pro 3 which is deliberately a simple camera. Um, one of the reasons why the, I'd spoken to a Fuji person and they told me whether this is true or not they didn't put in this flippy screen in the X Pro 3 is not that they hadn't considered it it's that 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 there is a point of breaking that there is a return item for Fujifilm that there means a client's going to claim under warranty or have fights about it or it's going to give the camera a bad name so they know that the user of the X Pro 3 doesn't want that they want a camera that can throw in a bag on location on assignment a camera is like a tank and I know it is a tank that thing's incredibly strong so they positioned this well and I think they've done exceptionally well so it's very important to me it's one of the most important things you can get all happy about amazing features and blah 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 but if your camera doesn't stand the test of time if you can tr if you can't pick it take it out of your bag and have total peace of mind that you've got a, a serious working tool in your hand then you've got problems so I can safely say number one that I'm talking about is durability and form and Fujifilm have su succeeded in this department they've done exceptionally well so well done Fujifilm all right second point I'm going to talk to you about in-body image stabilizer I can't believe I'm talking to you about this because I for one find a, this used to find or find still deciding a little bit overrated as in the amount of like videography I understand totally totally get it 100% and, and I think this is part of the reason why it's in this camera is because of its hybrid nature which I'll discuss but from a photography point of view I admit I've underestimated image uh, stabilizing or in-body image stabilizer a little bit because I found and I'm very slow to admit it when I've taken the XH1 out on particularly wildlife um, jobs that I've done where I'm using it with the 200 f2 or the 100 to 400 um, and we just as the the best shots coming come in when the the lights going down and the animals start coming you know out of there they, they, they're on the move the animals because it's not as hot yeah you it's it's it's, an, it's a great added benefit to the camera so I take back what I said I'm not 100% taking it back I'm just giving you a little bit so it, I'm happy to see that they've managed to put this into the camera from a photography perspective and the price hasn't gone exceptionally out of control by doing it they're still relatively close to the cost of the previous edition of this the X-T3 and I think that's that's something that I've got to give credit for is that you've put in a pretty expensive feature and the price hasn't got totally out of control so well done Fujifilm I'm not complaining I like it there because I know I'm going to benefit it from somewhere I'm just sort of old school and I can't admit that I like image um, in-body image stabilizer so I've got to say that's very very good so when it comes to the, the actual body itself I can see why the body is slightly larger and two points on this uh, in this in body sorry I'm I'm just I'm really going to battle with this Ibis can I just call it, I'm going to call it Ibis I don't know why I started the video like in body image stabilizer Ibis much easier the two things that I know about and I know from the past about Ibis at least chatting to some Fujifilm guys and also just reading things in general when the X-H1 came out I'm not convinced the X-H1 was the camera that they've touted it to be I think that it was a little bit of a change of direction because of the market so I think when the Sony A9 came out the X-H1 appeared I don't think that was intended to be an X-H1 I got a feeling that was intended to be something more along the XT lines and then they just sort of know we can't put that out we need to develop something else and they created a new line that was just my guess I don't know if I'm, I'm right about that but and then obviously the X-T3 came out afterwards and they kind of created that separation and one of the separation key points was that, that the X-H1 had the uh, Ibis in it and the X-T3 wouldn't uh, X, people said well the X-T3 is the photographer's camera well actually the X-Pro is the photographer's camera the X-T3 is the photographer's camera with a bit of video even though it had 60 frames and not 30 frames and the X-H1 is really that video guy who does a bit of shooting as well in photography um, and to a degree there's truth in that but really um, I don't think I think that they always intended to somehow get the uh, Arbus into the XT range somewhere down the line um, and I think by getting feedback on the X-H1 because the one thing I don't like about the X-H1 is that screen on the top at unnecessary size now some people love it and that's fine we all different in the what, the what we do 
and appreciate but it's the same reason why the 50r is way more appealing than the 50s to me is that i don't need all that nonsense on it like i don't need a top screen when i've got an evf with all the information that i could need i've got an, an lcd i mean how many more points in the camera do i need to give me information so just in the way i shoot so like the xh1 never appealed to me its size and everything like to me the beauty of the xt range was this the simplicity of it no extra screens no funny business um but out of it, they got a lot of information. They got a, they got a new market that formed on the XH1, people who love it. And they realized like from a battery capacity, I'm sure they've learned a lot, um, the size that's required. So then they had to go off and work really hard at getting this into the smaller body and keep the body pretty much the same as what the X-T3 had. Second point was some lenses in there, from what I can see, some lenses on the X, um, in the XF range the image circle is slightly larger than the APS-C sensor. I think a lot of the primes are like that, and I think that improves image quality to some degree. I don't know how that works. That's what I've heard. And some are very close to the edge on it. Now, the problem with IBIS is that it requires that, that there has to be a little bit of space there because if the sensor has to move, you, you don't want to be getting a vignetted corner or, or loss of light in the corners, and then you're having to digitally manipulate by adding the pixels back in and things like that. Like It has to be as simple as possible. And I think that partly is the reason why some lenses on the list have a higher stop rate than others, even ones that are not image stabilized themselves. I think it has something to do with this image circle that's produced. I'm not 100% sure about that. So the incredible thing that Fujifilm have done, and I think we've got to take our hats off to them, is that they've put an image stabilizer, Ibis, into an incredibly small body with no real impact on us. In fact, I think maybe the body is a nicer body than the previous one from a grip perspective and a, and a premium feel. And they've managed to get around giving us five stops all in body, sorry, not five stops, five axis all in body with this issue that they had previously. Because I remember then articles I read during the X-T1 when it had been released and the X-T2. I think Fujifilm said in a statement, we would never, we could never implement IBIS into our bodies. I stand to be corrected, but I, I'm almost certain that someone senior in Fujifilm said, we could never implement IBIS into our bodies because of this issue with the lenses. So they've overcome it. And I think that's, that's tremendous that they've been able to create something that, that gives us um, pitch, uh, yawn, whatever the different aspects of it, um, roll, those things, and focal information and aperture information and lens information that all makes up what 5-axis um, stabilization is. They've been able to implement it into this body design. And that's incredible. So well done Fujifilm on that. Um, take my hats off to you. And I'm not complaining. I'm not complaining. There's a couple of things I might trade for it, but <laughs> I won't tell you about those. Um, and then the third one, the third point. And arguably, outside of durability, this is the one that excites me the most. This is the most important update that Fujifilm has had in years. I've complained about it and I've complained about it and no one's ever done anything about it and I just got tired of complaining. You can go back to my previous videos like on the X-T3 and X-T2 and even I think the X-T30. I mentioned this. It drives me nuts. It's not the flippy screen, don't worry. Not the flippy screen. I know that this is a big talking point and I promise you I will talk about it in upcoming videos. It's this. Is this not the coolest thing ever? This is amazing. I'm in awe. Incredible. <sighs> I'm almost out of breath just mentioning it. Okay, so I currently use, let's count it. Yep, I counted 13 batteries. In fact, it's 14 because the 14th one is in the camera that I'm using now to film me. But 14 batteries I use. Okay, so as light as my bag is and as small as my gear is and how compact I travel, because I travel a lot, I have those 14 batteries and they drive me nuts. Now, people say 14 is overkill. Why do you have 14? Well, unlike other shooters, I'm sure there's some people in my position, I move from literally one shoot to the next within a day or two. I could even have three back-to-backs where I don't have time. So I'll get back at one in the morning from a big, big do or big event or big wedding. And I don't want to be sitting there uh, charging at like two, three in the morning when I'm getting up at seven to start the next job. So it's important for me that like on a big wedding day, let's just say it's a Jewish wedding where there's 15 groomsmen and 20 bridesmaids. Let's just say it's the biggest of the biggest and there's 400 people, 500 people. I might use 
seven, eight batteries uh, on that day. I mean, average weddings are probably five or six batteries, but between the two bodies, uh, I might use them all. And then the next day I might have a day off to shoot or I might move into another wedding, which is not often. I don't often like to double back on weddings because the second wedding can take a knock depending on how physically exhausted you are from the first. But I want to know that I'm covered without having to stress about charging. Let's discuss what this battery can do. According to Fujifilm, my old battery could give me about 350 shots sort of on a normal mode, not boost mode or economical mode, like normal mode. And I think they got that figure totally wrong. Now, surprisingly, they got it wrong on the positive side, which is really weird for companies. Companies don't normally do that, but they're way more conservative. Okay, maybe I'm not a chimper like a lot of people. I don't chimp and I don't shoot video, but they were talking about stills in that, in, in that um, comparison. They said 350, I get like eight, 900, seven, eight, 900, depending on what I'm doing, shots of one battery. Um, yeah, so I, I get a lot of photographs of one battery because I don't chimp a lot and I use my EVF as I should. Um, if I'm doing flash, then I have to check first and second exposure before I carry on and things like that. So sometimes I do, but not often, and maybe that's why I get more. So I'm hoping that they are as conservative about the estimates in this battery as they are with the old battery. Uh, I haven't yet put it through its paces totally. So I've, I can confirm it's way longer lasting than the old one, at least double. I just can't confirm how much. But if it's as conservative as the last ratings, then I'm looking at 13, 14, 1500 in my, the way I shoot, shots per battery. And that means I'm halving, over halving my battery. So I can take my 14 batteries down to possibly six batteries, five or six of these batteries. And that's a huge difference to me because weight of the battery is slightly more than the old, but not double the weight and not double the size, slightly bigger and slightly heavier. So I'm reducing the weight in my bag and every kilogram when you're flying makes a massive difference because each airline is different in what they allow you and don't allow you and things like that. So this is massive news for me and, and I can't even underestimate how important this change is for Fujifilm. I just wish they had used this time to change all their batteries. Like they were fixated on IBIS, there's that word again, with this battery and that's why they developed this battery. This could have benefited all other cameras as much. Imagine the X-Pro3 with this, just giving us that incredibly long lasting um, usage from a photography point of view, or even the X100V, whatever it is. The V, the 100V, the Pro3 and the X-T4 all should have been given the new battery. There should have been a total change. Shoop, this is what we're doing. And from this point onwards, it's all new batteries. That's my perspective. It should have been a universal change. So I'm happy for you, and I'll give you, I'll give you the, the praise for doing this. But from now on, I'm on your case to change the other cameras as well to the same battery. So those are the three important improvements that this camera has made and I'm very impressed with. I will be reviewing this camera further. I've got uh, some videos coming up. The next video is going to be the 100 to 400 against the 200 f2 lens. Not really against each other, but I'm going to compare them and I'm going to show you how they both perform. After that review, I'm going to be pairing the X-T4 with the 200 f2 lens and I'm going to be testing its 15 frames per second frame rate, its mechanical frame rate. Uh, I've got to be honest, 15 frames per second means absolutely nothing to me. So maybe I'm the wrong guy for this. But anyway, I'm going to test it. Maybe I'll learn something new, but it's something I don't use. I don't even use 11 frames per second. I'm a person who, who watches the action and gets it. Just waits for that moment and captures it. I find when I fire off these frame rates, I actually miss the point exactly where I want it. But I, I totally respect that there are things out there that you cannot just guesstimate it. You can't just, you know, visually see it happen and then take a photograph. You've got to burst off a number of frames. Totally get that. So let's put it through its paces. Let's see what it can do. So thanks so much for your time, everyone. Really appreciate it. Thank you for subscribing, those who have. If you like what you see, please do subscribe. And if you enjoyed the video, like it. It does make a massive difference to my channel. Please also go check out my other videos. I've got a lot of tutorials and uh, reviews as well to check out. Might be a benefit to you. And for those of you in lockdown and around the world, I hope you're keeping safe. Um, you know, treasuring this time with your loved ones, uh, keeping productive, not being too bored. But yeah, thanks so much again and God bless.